You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Dr. Moisha Sif. He received his PhD from Hebrew University, did a postdoc fellowship in genetics at Harvard Medical School. I currently holds a James McGill professorship at GlaxoSmithKline, uh, chair in pharmacology. Uh, many, many accolades here, and we're going to be talking about uh, his work uh, on social epigenetics. I'm not sure what that means, but Moisha, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, what, what is uh, social epigenetics, or I guess more simply, what, what is your current work about? What's it entail? Um, I have been working on epigenetics for the last uh, 40 years, uh, trying to understand uh, essentially how genes are programmed and uh, how uh, different experiences in life uh, change the way genes are programmed. And that led us to social epigenetics, realizing that not only chemicals and um, you know, hard stuff uh, can change the way genes work, but also social experiences can change the way genes work. And that created for the first time a link between social sciences and um, and hardcore DNA. So, okay, uh, I guess, you know, if I smoke cigarettes or if I work out a lot at the gym, you know, I'm turning on and off genes or, I, you know, I'm affecting my epigenetics. It doesn't seem too far-fetched. I've wondered, you know, what if I, sat there and meditated, you know, and did this for a period of weeks or months or years, and that would affect my epigenetics. But, you know, when you talk about the social side of it, what have you seen that maybe is, uh, is surprising? How can people affect their, their gene expression in ways right. that are so simple ways? Yeah, we need to differentiate between two ways by which, which genes can be affected. One is, of course, uh, you know, if you're exposed to something, you turn on and turn off genes. That's what genes are supposed to do. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about changing how the genes are programmed forever or for a long time. So you're exposed to a cigarette now, and then 20 years down the line, the effects of that cigarette will be seen on your gene. So that's epigenetic programming, in difference from just programming gene expression, which is the immediate response uh, to an exposure to a cigarette. And so in a certain way, we're changing the way our genes um, are uh, by experiences that extend well beyond uh, the time that the experience had uh, appeared, which means that everything has a consequence, and the consequence is not just a immediate consequence, but long term. For the first time, we noticed that it's not just chemicals that can do that, although even that took a long time to understand that you know exposures don't only change things immediately, but actually change the way genes are programmed for a long time and perhaps even for many generations, uh, was an experiment that we did here at McGill with Michael Meany, where we looked at uh, maternal care in rats and how differences in maternal care, uh, which is a very classical you know, social behavior, um, affect the way the animals will develop. So when the animals are adults, they'll have completely different characteristics based on the way their mother treated them years before. And uh, we oh, asked the question, how is this possible? Yeah, I think I heard about this. This is the, the rat, rat mothers that licked their yeah. pups a right. lot and some yeah. didn't. And Okay, yeah, can you, can you go over what happened in the experiment again? So, you know, in, in, in this study, it was first an observational study that rats that lick their pups uh, more frequently, uh, their pups, when they grow to become adults, uh, they will have different stress responsivity, different what we call phenotypes, different characteristics. Um, 
than rats that were not treated as frequently. So high maternal care shapes the long, lifelong behavior and physical characteristics of their offspring. And mm. how is that possible, right? So we try to understand how is it possible that this, this works? Um, we still believe that everything is, is somehow connected to the way genes work. So we reason that what is happening is that the maternal behavior is changing the way genes are programmed in, in the pups. And, and that really launched this field of social epigenetics when we discovered the epigenetic changes uh, that are initiated by maternal behavior that then remain well after the mother is dead. Well, I mean, in humans, you know, if you beat your children or you abuse them, they tend not to grow up and to be too well adjusted. So similar phenomena, I guess, different creature. But um, some, I guess, would try to say, oh, that's just, uh, you know, their mental responses and not physiological changes. So you've observed literally different physiology from rats. No, no, not just physiology. physiology. We, if we observe differences in the chemistry of DNA. And so okay. it's not just hand waving, you know, kinds of oh yeah, yeah, you you right, right, right. Together and things happen. Uh, the question is, how do they happen? Why do they happen? When you when you say uh, changes in the DNA, does that mean like different methylation patterns, uh, different yes. histone yes. deacetylation patterns, right. that kind of stuff? Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Okay. What about do you see different changes in the underlying DNA itself, or just at the no the sequences do not change. The sequences do not change. And here is the thing we inherit. Their sequence lasts for life, and it stays the same in every tissue in our body. That cannot change. Oh. But the way they work can change. And, you know, before that, the, the main emphasis was on genetics, on, you know, genetic differences that can explain psychological, behavioral, social difference. But what we discovered is that the overwhelming force is not really the genetic differences. And how your genes are put to work uh, by experience. Okay. Well, when you, how do you profile someone epigenetically? I would think every different cell type reacts differently, or do they, or do a lot of them act in concert under a stress response? So you know, there are things that are different, and things are the same. It has to do with the job of the gene. Certain genes need need to work in the same way in, in across tissues, and others are highly specialized. Uh, stress is something that covers the whole body, although it will have different effects in different tissues. Um, stress affects the immune system, it affects the brain, it affects fat, it affects metabolism. So it's integrated across the body, and therefore it's not surprising that you'll find some changes in DNA methylation that will be common to a lot of tissues and others that will be different. Okay, so how many, you know, in, in determining this, how many different uh, cell types did you look at? And, you know, I don't think you looked at all of them, you know, so maybe you did a subset and you said, all right, well, it's probably likely that it applies to all of them. Or of course, not all of them. Uh, although we would love to do it. It's just a financial issue. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a project that will cost them the billions. But um, um, what we, one can do and what we did, we first looked only in the brain. And we only looked in very specialized areas of the brain uh, that are highly responsive and controlling stress. Uh, but then we found that it's not just the brain. To our surprise, uh, the immune system was also affected. And so uh, we looked at the immune system and, and the brain. Other, other people look at fat tissue and muscle tissue. Um, you know, uh, you're quite limited with what's accessible. Uh, of course, the most, it, it will be extremely interesting um, to look at the thousands of cell types, uh, how they respond to... Um, to 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 this kind of social signals early in life, and how these signals evolve during life. So, what have you figured out? What is uh, what's the mechanism of uh, epigenetic change? Have you figured out any of the mechanisms and what the path they would be? Oh, so you know, this is this is a, a, an area that is investigated uh, quite um, aggressively by a lot of people. Uh, in our original study, uh, we kind of deciphered that there is some sort of a pathway. Leading between, you know, um, maternal behavior releases mm. certain. This is this is an area of active research by many groups, um, you know, trying to figure out how experience uh, leads to uh, very particular changes in uh, the way genes 
are marked. Um, in our initial study and follow-up studies, we focused on uh, you know, the stress response pathway and uh, how maternal behavior elicits certain uh, hormones, uh, certain neurotransmitters in the brain, like, for example, serotonin, which is released when you feel good. Uh, that's that uh, neurotransmitter acts on what we call receptors, you know, proteins that can receive the signal, and then a series of proteins uh, that are connected to each other and uh, leading to um, what we call transcription factors, which are proteins that can find addresses on DNA the same way a postman can deliver a mail to a specific address. They can read the zip codes on the DNA and um, target uh, DNA grooming enzymes to particular sites. So this way, the maternal behavior ends up in particular addresses in the genome. I wouldn't know where to go in the genome and how to, you know, let's say like, um, I don't know, it's going to methylate this one part of the genome. How does it know that that part is the right part to methylate, for instance? And how does it know that that part may not be used for other types of genes in gene expression to make, you know, um, hurt the expression of other ancillary genes? Because they use a common area that other genes use. Of course, there will be uh, using, uh, you know, none of these systems is perfect, uh, but it's the combination that creates the perfection and that, Evolution has probably uh, generated transcription factors that, on one hand, can recognize specific, you know, DNA addresses. On the other hand, they can be kicked uh, in the head by by signals coming from the outside world. And not all cells are going to change. And so there is speciation in which cell types are responsive to um, to that signal. So in the hippocampus, there you know, millions of neurons, only some of them will change. And why these neurons and not others, uh, this is why, you know, we have evolution, is to uh, figure out these things by trial and error, which are the things that increase fitness and others that don't. Uh, transcription factors um, can read very specific addresses in the genome. They can also uh, talk to signaling that comes from the surface of the cell. So they can connect uh, the surface of the cell with, with the addresses in the genome. Do we ad understand everything? No. The complexities? Of course not. Uh, but we, we have some hint how these things work. What are some elements of this whole system that you'd love to understand? You know, for instance, uh, what is the it's DNA indexing system? Uh, you know, what about that? Let's say, as an example, one of the elements of this whole you know, epigenetic change uh, you said it seems to, there seems to be the ability for compounds to index the DNA and to go to a very specific location and know that right. that's the right location to do their work. Oh, you know, they that don't mechanism know. Alone, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That this this mechanism is very very well known. So transcription factors, uh, the way their protein is structured, they can see certain sequences. So we have evolved a whole battery of transcription factors that can go to different parts of the DNA, and they know how to get there. This is actually quite known. Um, how, how all of this makes sense within, you know, within a context of an environment, it's very complicated. And um, it's beyond my understanding even how to approach it, uh, because we have a combination of things that happen. Uh, how, how things can see specific addresses in the DNA, that's simple. How is this good for us? And how, how an early experience knows that sending the transcription factors to these places in these cells is what will increase their fitness or their survival or their long-term uh, well-being. We don't understand that. And, and that probably required trials and errors of evolution to figure this out. So what in particular are you focused in on? What do you want to elucidate? Is it the overall... Ability of this to happen at all is it to predict? No, I think that's that's what that's, my, that's known. Uh, we're interested in in different questions. One question is how to take advantage of this uh, to um, to predict um, disease early, and um, this is one area that I'm very interested in. The second area is how to take this to therapy, how to apply epigenetic principles and intervention. And the third area, of course, is still we, there are many open questions about how methylation affects gene expression and how other 
forms of modification like hydroxylation, formulation, uh, effect gene expression. So there are a lot of uh, mechanical questions that are still open that needs to be need to be understood. But I would like to jump and uh, move forward without understanding everything and seeing how we can use it to, uh, to predict disease early, problems early, and to prevent them. Well, for instance, how would you envision using it to predict um, disease? And for example, can we predict Alzheimer's early? Are there methylation signals uh, in blood that tell us that that person is developing Alzheimer's? And uh, if we can do that, there are many probably already available therapies that might work. And the failure of Alzheimer's treatment is not that the drugs were not good, is that when a person knows they have Alzheimer's, already the brain is dead. And so it's very hard to, to treat a dead brain. But if you can capture it before the brain has died, or before the parts of the brain that are important have died, then some treatment might work. If you look at cancer, cancer is a disease that could be cured if detected early. But in most cases of death, the causes of cancer are late detection. Can we detect it early? If you look at aging, which is another aspect that, you know, where epigenetics is actually driving the process. If we can detect acceleration of aging early, uh, perhaps certain interventions could prevent that from happening. So there's so much to do and so many opportunities in using those programs to detect disease early uh, and, to, um, and to intervene and prevent um, deterioration. Well, what appears to be the most direct link to epigenetic change? Is there a particular condition that's been identified as you know, having a radical effect on epigenetics? Or are you looking for ones that have a very specific effect on epigenetics and only affect a few discrete areas? I would guess if you can elucidate the mechanism by which some kind of disease causes a change or is correlated with a change in epigenetics, then uh, that might be a good way to attack it. Of course, of course. So in cancer, this is quite developed. Uh, we know, you know, we know a lot of epigenetic changes that are involved in basic processes that are driving cancer. And of course, there's already uh, attempts to, you know, try different therapeutic approaches. But I'm talking about two different, you're, you're mixing two different things. Is one is early detection, which really doesn't care if it's connected to, you know, to the mechanism as long as it, it works. And uh, the second one is, is treatment, which tries to reverse uh, changes that are important for the disease. And in, in both areas, progress is made. Um, we're not looking for specific things. Uh, we're looking for uh, treatments that can essentially shake the epigenetic system and, and kind of reverse it to a more uh, tolerable uh, state. The epigenetic uh, system is affected by everything in our life, so there's no particular thing that affects it. Um, at some point, it, 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 it changes in a way that is not good for us, and the question is how do we bring it back? Um, and um, there are also many different things that can, again, can bring back the epigenetic system uh, from you know nutritional supplements to uh, to exercise to lifestyle changes and other things and uh, these are things that need to be worked out. Well, if you understand how, for instance, epigenetic change can happen, uh, you need to understand that to undo it. I would think, you know, and then you look for specific changes and try to watch and figure out all the steps in which they happen and then try to undo them or prevent them right. from happening. For instance. Right, right. I mean, but yes, I mean, of course, we want to understand this, but um, I'm not sure that will help us undo them. I think uh, uh, the way the system works is as a system. So it's not like there's one change happening. There's multiple changes happening. Uh, and it's not the specificity of the change, but it's the specificity of the combination. It's the setting of the network. And so you want to reset the network. It's very different than, you know, fixing one or two changes. and the way to reset the network is probably by shocking the network. And this is what we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the shockers that we can shock the network? Uh, exercise is resetting a whole network. Uh, differences in diets are resetting network. Uh, going to a vacation is probably resetting networks. And to figure out the combination of resets that we need to achieve a better you know, state of the network is the challenge. So we have to move from the, you know, the classic way of thinking about a specific change and a specific outcome uh, to um, systems, 
uh, resetting to different states. Uh, this is the main challenge uh, in this field. Uh, what about in cancer? I mean, I would think that uh, cancer cells change their expression, but that's happening within a given population of cells. So, so in, yeah, sure, yeah. I'm sure they're interacting with the network around them, but it seems like the cells are the ones that are doing the measuring and the adaptation at right. that individual cellular level in cancer. So there, perhaps that's an easier way to figure out how this could happen or be undone is by looking at cancer, because again, it seems to be less of a systemic response or a, you know, a very, very small system, you know, the tumor itself, for instance. Um, I'm not sure about that. And so I think that's the classic way of looking at it. Uh, but even in cancer, when you look at the methylation system, the change is thousands, we're not talking one. And so we can reset the system uh, by sometimes simple manipulations. And, um, and so the idea that, yes, there are certain cancers that develop certain, you know, surface molecules that could be targeted by drugs, and that is really working well. But overall, cancer is a systemic change in the way thousands of genes are working. And so a more basic approach to treat it is to figure out a way how to reset that system. And also, cancer is not just a disease of cancer cells. Um, it's becoming very clear that the immune system is highly involved in cancer. And some of the new therapies actually target the immune system. The immune system is the host. The immune system is all over the body. And the immune system is also regulated by the brain and by other experiences. So at the end of the day, I think we're moving from, you know, the reductionist approach to a more holistic understanding of how the system works and trying to figure out how to alter the system. I believe that even oh, in the overall, you know, holistic solutions will be probably much more powerful than what we have now. Well, it just seems to fly in the face of, uh, you know, Neo-Darwinist dogma, and for instance, with cancer, oh, it's a it's a random mutation that happens in a single cell. Well, yes. that's not a system. That's that's a single cell. It's not a system. So yes. it doesn't seem the two seem to be at odds. You know, this is an adaptive response, a purely adaptive response. It's not a random thing. So this seems to be at odds with you know again the common perception of the, the it's not Neo-Darwinist. Clear that, you know, it's not clear that cancer is actually triggered by mutation. And some cancers right. are, but others probably not. And um, and again, it's not clear that one mutation can drive cancer. And uh, probably that's not true. And um, is cancer really a selection or or is it a, um, a defect in the immune system? Are cancer cells unnatural or they're part of the natural system that goes out of balance? And within the genome, again, we're talking about thousands and thousands of genes that are changing. And, um, yeah. and one of yeah, and, and the problems with you know, curing cancer is the redundancy of the system is that we are trying to target molecules rather than targeting systems. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that works the best is chemotherapy because it really targets the whole cell. It kills the cell. Uh, and, um, and so specialized targets work in very, very few cases. But overall, every cancer cell is a systemic change. When you look at a methylation profile of a cancer cell, you can see um, an enormous change in many, many genes, all of which are important for, you know, cancer survival. A cell is a corporation. And um, to change the strategy of a corporation, you can't change just one guy. You have to change everybody in the system. And so, uh, so you know, cancer is a complex system. And, um, and, um, and cancer interacts with uh, the... Uh, the somatic cells around it, as well as with the immune system. And the immune system interacts with everything else. So um, I think I think cancer is not just a molecular Darwinian selection, but it's a defect in the system and will need a systemic solution. Well, that's good. I didn't think so either. You know, so that's good, whether you're, uh, you're not caught up in them. Yeah. Well, very good. What, what would be a, uh, you know, a super happy result for you to achieve or figure out in the next few years? Super happy will be, uh, you know, can we find predictors of cancer that will allow us to detect cancer extremely early and and prevent the death and morbidity that is caused by cancer? Uh, could we use, you know, systemic epigenetic approach that can prevent uh, or 
intervene in cancer without you having to resort to uh, you know the uh, uh, the poisons that we are treating cancer patients today. Yep. Yep. Definitely. And and it's similar for the mental health system. We have an epigenetic approach that will reverse drug addiction or uh, PTSD or chronic mm. pain. These are the questions that uh, you know we want. We're trying to deal with. Okay. Well, excellent. Well. What's the best way for people to find out more, uh, to read papers that you put out, you know, to, to get in touch? Um, so, you know, we have websites. Uh, there is a there is a company that I built just to deal with these questions called uh, HKG Epitherapeutics. And so www.hkgepitherapeutics.com uh, has a lot of information. And of course, pub, you know, any search in PubMed with my name will come up with all the papers. Yeah, you have an unusual name, so it should be pretty yeah. easy to find you. So yeah. that's great. Very, very unusual. So probably you'll find only my paper. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Moshe, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.